Welcome to Aircrew Interview. I'm Mike, and this episode is with Paul Kennard. Paul is a former RAF Chinook pilot, and in this interview, he chats about his training flying the Gazelle in the Wessex, right up to flying the Chinook operationally in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Northern Ireland. So, if you like what we do here, head over to patreon.com forward slash aircrew interview to help us out for as little as $1 a month. Also, visit us at aircrewinterview.tv to watch all of our other interviews and sign up to our newsletter. Enjoy. So, Paul, when did you first become interested in aviation? Um, it's something from when I was a, a very, very small child. Um, my mum used to take me up to, mum and dad used to take me up to air shows, take me to Gatwick, and in fact, initially, ironically, I ended up hating aeroplanes. I hated the noise. <laughs> um, but eventually, the sort of penny dropped. Uh, and, and I think probably from the age of five or six, it's what I wanted to do. Yeah. So what year did you join the RAF? Uh, I joined full time in 92. Um, I'd been on the University Air Squadron in London for ULAS for a couple of years before, prior to that. But yeah, joining the Air Force, started officer training in 1992. Did you first want to go to helicopters? Was that your initial <laughs> Absolutely <course>? not, no. <laughs> uh, and in fairness, it wasn't the Air Force's plan either. Uh, I think you've got to put it in context of 1992. Lots of things were happening in the world. Uh, there was the peace dividend, the fall of the Berlin Wall, massive reductions in, si in, in force sizes all across NATO. The RAF was no exception. Uh, we had massively drowned, downsized RAF Germany. Uh, we effect were in the throes of giving up the F Phantom and Buccaneer fleets. And so by the time I joined the Air Force in 1992, got through officer training, got to basic flying training, they basically, first morning was, we don't actually need you. Ah, great, fantastic, wonderful. But the good news is, if you're still here at the end of the course, you're only going fast check. That's the only people we want. We don't need anybody else. Uh, so we're going to bump the pass mark up. And if you make it, you make it. If not, you don't. And so right from the first word go, those blinkers were on. Fast jet blinkers. That's all you're going to do is fly fast jet. The problem I had with that is I desperately wanted to fly the Phantom or the Buccaneer. And as I was going through flying training, I watched them both disappear out of service. So I was kind of struggling to think, oh, what do I actually want to fly? And I had a real sort of thinks bubble. But no, no, helicopters were never part of the plan. Yeah. So could you tell us a bit about the elementary aircraft you flew? In the um, so I, I did the, what's known, I suppose, as the classic uh, RAF entry uh, air cadet flying scholarship at Goodwood. Flew the uh, Piper Tomahawk, which is, which is probably one of the few aeroplanes I've no intention of ever strapping on again. Um, ghastly little thing. But, you know, at 17, somebody gives you an aeroplane, you fly it, don't you? Yeah. Uh, and then University Air Squadron on the Bulldog, which was a wonderful aeroplane. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's anybody who's not ever flown the Bulldog on the University Air Squadron who wouldn't leap at the chance of flying it again. And the Bulldog was great. Three years at university, flying the Bulldog, aerobatics, formation flying, all that sort of stuff. That was great. And then I came out of officer training in 93. And as I said, there was this peace dividend going on. Uh, we were all sent off to various holds, holdovers between courses. Uh, my hold was at Bryce Norton. I was told you're waiting for a year before a Takano course. I was like, great. So I sat there in station ops at Bryce Norton, um, doing a bit of this and a bit of that, nothing very exciting. And I got a phone call one day saying, do you want to go to elementary flying training? Well, why would I want to do that? Well, it starts in two weeks and it starts the clock for your flying pay a bit quicker. Well, I'll go and do that then. So I went off to, to, to Linton on Ooze to live and to fly from Topcliffe on the, uh, the T-67, the Firefly, doing it had just been set up, the Joint Elementary Flying Training School Squadron, whatever it was, which was the first one of these part contractor, part military run organisations. And the, the T-67 is another aeroplane that I would actually gladly never fly again, because after the Bulldog, and uh, you know, it didn't roll, it didn't feel like a military aeroplane, it felt like what it was, which was a civilian aeroplane pressed into military service. Um, but I did that for six months, uh, and then yeah, finished EFTS, then went off to, to BFTS on the Takano. Yeah, so could you tell us what the Takano was like to fly? Uh, the Takano liked to fly. Um, it was fabulous every time there wasn't somebody in the boot nagging at me. Uh, I think as a, as a young man getting in an aeroplane which has broadly the same power to weight ratio as a Hurricane, um, it was enormous fun. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference between enjoying flying and being taught and being under pressure. And I think the aircraft, the aircraft itself was great fun. They, it had a lot of foibles. Um, you know, it was definitely was a politically driven aeroplane rather than necessarily requirements driven aeroplane. Um, it had some rather non-jet like handling. Uh, if you pop the air brake out above a certain speed, the nose would pitch up. Well, it's not supposed to do that in an air brake, it's supposed to slow you down a straight line. Um, it didn't have auto rudder. So if you, if you floored it, the aeroplane would first yaw, which obviously a jet doesn't do, and then secondary effects of yaw thing would start torque rolling as well. So um, although it was great fun to fly, 
you felt under pressure an awful lot. And that pressure from that first day of turning up at a, fl a flying train being told, we don't need you. You've got to make single seat fast jet stand, otherwise we're, we're going to chop you. And that wasn't chopped to helicopter or multi-engine, that was chopped to navigator in regiment. It was chopping out of the pilot branch, which meant that potentially you didn't enjoy it as much. And I can probably count on one hand the amount of times I actually strapped to Carno one and actually enjoyed it for what it was. And three of those are solo and two of those was a post course land away. So okay. literally like that, it's, uh, it was, pressure is not a nice thing in flying training. Yeah. And I, think, I don't think there's anybody, there's very few people I knew were natural. I was never a natural pilot. I had to work really, really hard at it. And you know, I had a couple of really quite severe bumps through flying training, but it was, I got there in the end. Yes. So obviously we just said uh, you went on to rotary wing training. Uh, where was this and when did it start? Uh, RAF Shawbury, um, which is probably still the best kept secret in the RAF. Um, absolutely fabulous station. Uh, lovely location below Shropshire. Um, a very, very pro, pro uh, local community, despite the amount of noise we must cause into them. Uh, and just a lovely station. And, Sh and, Sh and Shrewsbury, just down the road, a delightful place to go out and take um, adequate refreshment. <laughs> so what aircraft did you actually start training on? I was very lucky. I, did the, I ended up on the last completely military uh, helicopter course they did at Shawbury. So I did the Gazelle to start with, which is um, an aeroplane that I think any, again, a bit, like, um, a bit like the Bulldog. Everybody who's flown the Gazelle, there's very few people have a bad word to say about it because it was a fabulous little machine. Yeah. So could you tell us, once you got there, basic handling, what kind of training sorties would you do? Um, once you got basic, you, uh, they would teach you how to do a number of different things for you to go solo. The, the key one was the engine off landing, which was in the Gazelle, frankly, terrifying. Uh, and the QHIs are all wetting themselves, laughing at this stage, because they love that sort of stuff. For me, absolutely not. Engine off landing in an aeroplane, you lose a donk in the uh, Intercarno. You know, it was a very simple equation. You lose the engine look at the height, have I got glide range from an airfield? If I haven't, point in a safe direction, eject. Simple. Mm -hmm. um, in the Gazelle, no option. You know, the motto helicopters is survive the crash. So you are into a situation where you're, the ground is coming up really quickly uh, and all you've got is what, whatever potential energy you've got stored in your rotor system. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a work of art at the bottom to, to check, flare and level and then roll the aeroplane on. And of course the Gazelle's got skids, so you, you aim for grass, otherwise it gets a bit sparky out the side. Mm -hmm. um, but it's that whole, the, the last five to six seconds, it, it's pure flying. It's pure flying and pure judgment. The computer can't do it for you. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, you would do it, you would master it straight in, then you'd go solo. And the first helicopter solo was, was just brilliant. I mean, it was, it took me right back to 17, strapped into a Piper Tomahawk at Goodwood again. It was just, wow, this is, it felt like going solo again. You know, if you can lose your virginity twice, it felt like it. Um, and it, and it was a, uh, yeah, a great experience. But then after that, you went into sloping ground, learning the, land the aeroplane on a slope, which, which because of where the lift vector goes and because of all sorts of things you learn about in ground school, such as dynamic rollover and all that sort of stuff is, is actually harder than it looks. Um, uh, and you'd look at more and more advanced different ways of auto rotation. So yeah, the, the worst one we did was a was the was, was two that were dreadful. I used to hate them. Uh, one was the constant attitude, where you basically bring the aeroplane back almost to a hover, and in the gazelle it was a committed manoeuvre. So it would be a bit like in a in a in a, in a fixed wing aeroplane, just turn the engine off and actually doing it for real. Every time you did a PFL, you did it for real in the gazelle, because you'd, you'd settle into auto rotation. The instructor would then say, "Yeah, I think we're going to make it." Boo. And he need retard the throttle and you couldn't actually wind the throttle up again in time to affect what happened at the ground so it's a committed maneuver so the constant attitude you basically came down almost vertically and you got to a stage you just went load of this just to arrest the rate of descent and it's a bit like if you if you're on those those fair ground rides that shoot you up and then they shoot you down and they cushion at the bottom that's basically what you're trying to do um, and of course if you do that though there's also a bit of that you need to do as well and then you have a bit of that to hold it straight so the bottom it was like a it was that, oh, where are we going? And you want to land straight, because if you land at an angle, that's when you roll the aeroplane. So that was quite emotional, doing that sort of thing. <coughs> Paul, you also trained on the Wessex. What was this like to fly? Well, this, this beastie here, albeit a little bit different to the ones that I, uh, I trained on, the, the Gazelle was all about learning to fly a helicopter as a pilot. Um, the Wessex was all about learning to, A, operate as a crew, and B, operate a helicopter as a useful asset on the battlefield. So we had 
And, you know, you, at, at the time I did it, you had one squadron with Gazelles and two squadron with Wessex. And I was very, very lucky to be the last course to go through on this beast um, through flying training. And that was yeah, so all about learning how to do understung loads, uh, you, applications of helicopters rather than just learn to fly it. The idea was the Gazelle taught you how to fly a helicopter. The well, Wessex course gave you effectively the, the understanding of how to utilise it. So, Paul, after your rotary wing training, where did you go to? Um, well, I, uh, I ended up holding again, <laughs> as everybody seems to do at the time. I, you know, I think I ended up to, I was quite lucky, I ended up about two years holding throughout my career. A lot of people did a lot more. Um, some, of the, some of the guys off my Linton course ended up holding two and a half years just to get a valley. Uh, so I went to Manston and I held for about six months at Manston, helping to, to run a military civil air safety day, which was quite good fun. Um, and, uh, and then I started, eventually started the Chinook OCU at the end of the summer. So how did you feel getting Chinooks? Um, it's what I'd asked for. I was very happy. I think the only disappointment was I knew there was a Chinook course starting about two weeks after we graduated and I kind of hoped I'd be on that one uh, and I wasn't. I was on the one that was starting sort of six months later. So uh, the only disappointment was that I had to wait six months to, uh, to start the Chinook course but it gave me the opportunity to get married so it, was quite, oh, okay. it all worked out quite well. Yeah. So could you tell us a bit about your ground training? When did it start and what did it involve? Um, ground training the Chinook at the time um, was, uh, I think, traditional, to use the word. Uh, we had instructors on the aircraft. It was all delivered by military guys, the ground school, uh, guys who'd flown the aeroplane. Uh, we were still in the throes. That we were at the tail end of the modification program from Mark 1 to Mark 2. Um, and so there was a lot of corporate knowledge still about the Mark 1 and still a few unknowns about the Mark II at that stage. It was still a relatively new aircraft. Uh, but it was all chalk and talk. It was all um, done in, uh, in classrooms with view folder files and overhead projectors. And there wasn't that much in the way of, of computer aided training. Um, so we did quite a lot of that. And then we had um, the flight simulator at the time. It wasn't the swish swanky flight simulator building we've got at Benson now. It was an ex, ex North Sea oil rig cockpit that had been converted to look broadly like ours based at Farnborough um, operated by British International Helicopters and it was night only so you learn all your start and stops and it was all night it, it, you know at best it could be twilight if you crank the light up really high mm -hmm. and so we did a lot of ground school learned a lot of the basics sat in the airplane you then went and had a famil flight and then you went to the simulator and did quite a lot of simulator work before you came back to the aircraft again um, nowadays it's there's much much more synthetic um, and when I went back to refresh on the Chinook in 2010 I probably did 60% of the course in the simulator and that's a because it saves money it saves availability on aircraft and b because actually the flight simulator complex at Benson is actually very good at delivering a lot of that elementary training on the aircraft. So can you remember your first flight? I do yeah um, it was a very similar in concept to the the first flight you did on the Wessex which was the checklist was so complicated the checklist was so long that you basically did a start stop and a circuit mm -hmm. and that was basically your first that took a full hour mm -hmm. um, it took you a long time to start the airplane because you know you've learned some of the you've learned the checklist you've tried desperately to, to memorize it um, but it's a question of getting in the cockpit and then looking around and then looking at something going oh that's that that's that that's that and learning in sequences and remembering where your hand should go so the first trip, it, you know, it, the only thing I can remember is I was just pleased I managed to start and stop it without torching an engine. Yeah. So how did it differ compared to the Wessex and Gazelle? Could you see in the difference? Massively. Uh, it, and it's almost, you know, you've got, we're sitting in front of the Paseki here, which is a tandem rotor helicopter a lot like the Chinook. It's a very, it's a fundamentally different way of flying. Um, the lack of tail rotor means that there is no torque reaction to counter. So when you're pulling up the lever, you haven't got to think about pedal. Um, in the Wessex, for example, when we did an op phase at, uh, at Odium, and if you think about a, a normal helicopter, the tail rotor and the main rotor are all run from the same set of engines, obviously. You haven't got separate engines that run the tail rotor. So when you apply power, when you want more effort out of the tail rotor, it takes maximum power away from what you can deliver mm. through the engines. In the case of the Wessex, the Wessex we used at Shawbury, the Mark II, actually had more power available from the engines and the transmission could actually accommodate. And the Wessex, the Wessex memory serves had a maximum of 3,200 pounds of torque through the transmission. Yeah. And I lifted up to the hover at, at Odium in a Wessex, coming back, flying back to Shawbury at the end of the, of the tack phase. And as I lifted, we started turning and I put power pedal in and hit the limit of 3-2 and we're still turning. 
I mean, it's graceful 360 degree turn with the aircraft. And I'm, uh, uh, what do I do? And the instructor's looking across the cockpit, he's laughing at me, saying, just come down a little bit of height, come down a little bit of height, buy a bit more ground effect, buy a bit more power pedal back. And it was right on that margin all the time. It's like literally down to about three feet. And I've now got enough pedal to actually hold the airplane straight. Um, not an issue on a tandem made a helicopter because these two things rotate in opposite directions. There is no torque reaction. So that was the first thing. Um, wow, this is, this is actually easy. Second reaction was looking at the torque gauge when you lifted. And, you know, the Chinook at the time, lightweight, you'd lift the hover and it'd be about 42%. And you're used to helicopters hovering in the 70s, 80s. And this thing's, you know, how much power has this thing got? Answer, at training weight, an immense amount of power. So that feeling of power, the feeling of stability, this thing, you know, gust of wind, doesn't make any difference to it. The thing is just stable. The thing has got an enormous amount of power. Um, it was completely different to the Gazelle and, you know, a, an absolute light year ahead of the, uh, the sh of the Wessex. Mm -hmm. Just fantastic. So could you tell us about some of the training sorties you started on the Chinook? Yeah, um, the, you'd start off just you know, learning how to fly the airplane, basically. You'd have to learn how to fly around the circuit you would learn how to take it into confined areas. So a lot of the same basic skill set that you'd learned at Shawbury. Underslung loads. In fact, one of the funny ones was on the course, you would, you would have a stick buddy who would be your guy you'd go through the course with and one instructor would try to instruct both of you at the same time. And one of the early trips you'd do was an underslung load trip where you, you'd go away and you'd pick up a, you know, a, a wheelbarrow or something like a trailer and you'd fly around or a Land Rover, you'd fly around the circuit. One of the, one of the standard loads at Odeon was, a, was an ISO container because the Chinook used to move loads of stuff in an ISO container, probably still does. And um, what they did was the instructor would take you both out to load park. He would demonstrate one, you know, one of you be on the jump seat, one of you be flying, would be um, watching, you know, you're both watching the instructor do it. And then he said, right, out you get. Uh, you get out the jump seat and you'd, you'd walk around and this guy from JHSU, a hooker as we call them, would say, right, there you go, sir, get on top of that ISO container. Great. And you'd set them on top of the ISO container with the hook to hang on, hook, hook onto the underslung of the aircraft and, and, a, and, a, and a conductor to make sure you discharge the static electricity from the hook. And this Chinook will fly around the circuit and as it's flying towards you, you're kind of very aware that it's your mate flying it. And you know how bad you are at flying the aeroplane at that stage with about 15 hours on it. And you're thinking, oh, crikey, I'm sat on top of this thing and my mate's flying it. And it comes and it comes and it's looming over your head and you're reaching up and there's this massive helicopter just over your head and you, you, know, you discharge the static off the hook and you put the hook on and you jump off the ISO. And all the time you're aware it's your mate flying the aeroplane and he's just as rubbish as you are at this stage. So it focuses the mind on So that was quite good fun. So you went from understung loads, you then go into um, you know, the, the other sort of what we call general handling. So sloping ground, the aeroplane had some interesting sloping ground capabilities because the tail rotors and stuff like that, the, the rear rotors. Um, and then into you know, more operational stuff, you know, instrument flying, getting an instrument rating on the aeroplane understand what you can fly anywhere you need to fly in whatever weather uh, and then finally it builds up and builds up and builds up and builds up until you go away and have a tactical phase right towards the end of the course where you would be taught electronic warfare on the range at Spade Adam and you do um, some air-to-air -air fighter affiliation evaluation uh, uh, sort of affiliate affiliation training with with Hawks and at the time Tornado F3s so you built you gradually built up and built up and built up and in the middle of that you learn how to fly the airplane on goggles on MVGs now, nowadays, I, I believe the guys at Shawbury get an introduction to night vision goggles on, on the Griffin course, um, which is good. But the first time you fl I flew an MVGs, it was in a Chinook. Um, and that was another real sort of like, well, that's different. It's a very different way of flying an aeroplane. So did the Chinook have like a, a main role? <sighs> it sounds a bit trite. Um, the Chinook, a lot of people that fly it, a lot of people have used it, refer to it as a Swiss Army knife. It's really, really good at doing lots and lots of things. And the Chinook was a very easy aeroplane to fly, I thought. Um, even, you know, some people might argue that I made it look really hard to fly, but uh, I thought the Chinook was a very easy aeroplane to fly, very hard aeroplane to operate effectively, just because it was so capable. So if you were to go to a doctor in manual and get it out, what's the roles of the Chinook? It'll turn around, it will say, you know, intra-theatre airlift, it will say assault, trooping, cargo delivery, special forces delivery, military aid to the civil power, those sort of roles. Um, inside, if you break each of those down, there are several skill sets in each of those which you need to learn. And a long tasking day in the Chinook could involve almost every skill set you needed. And it, could, and it could pop up at any time. 
So that was what was hard about getting to grips with the Chinook, it was not flying the aeroplane per se, it was quite an easy aeroplane to fly, I thought, but it was getting your head around what you might have to do and have that information somewhere in your brain you could call up at relatively short notice. So go back to your training, did you have to train for all the types of uh, roles the Chinook uh, could Yes, uh, and, but I think it's important to understand the, the operational conversion unit at the time, again, I, you know, I'm not sure what they're doing on 28R now, but you, would, you were given a, a, a sort of introduction to all of them, and you would, you would say you would see all the skill sets you require. You'd have to make a certain minimum standard in each of those skill sets to pass the, to pass the OCU. But then you would have a, a period when, when you left the OCU, went to your frontline squadron, where there was a combat-ready workup period. Well, you know, at the time it was between six to twelve months, and you would fly. Although you were, you know, at the time you were allowed, you were let out because you were qualified to fly the aeroplane. You were limited combat-ready. You could go and do UK tasking and stuff. Um, where, but you, there was a, a training folder and a series of things that you had to be assessed on all the way up. So you'd be given the training staff, so the, 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 every flight would have a, a QHI, a qualified helicopter instructor. It'd have a QHTI, a qualified helicopter tactics instructor. There would be a, a training cell on the squadron, normally run by the standards officer. And you'd fly with all these people as you moved, basically ticked all these boxes of things you'd seen and passed, all the way from leaving the OCU as limited combat ready, to combat ready at the end. So Paul then moved on to 27 Squadron. How did you feel about this? I was very happy. Um, I think when you're setting a new unit up, it was quite exciting. The flight was brand new. Uh, it was a, the flight commander had managed to get hold of people from of different experiences. And I think um, everybody loves the first Squadron. You have a special, special place in your heart. You get there, you get off the OCU, and then you finally, you have that first feeling that I'm actually, I've actually made it. You've got to a squadron, you, you know, you put a patch on, you get your squadron acceptance done, uh, and there's a strong feeling that you've actually finally, you know, all that years and years of wanting to do it, all those years and years of training, you finally achieve what you're gonna do. And you, you, your wings technically aren't sewn on until you get combat ready. Um, so there's that, there's that angst of getting combat ready in that workup period in six to 12 months. But, you know, at the time, we had a really good mix on 27. We had a, a flight with quite a few navigators on, which was great because it meant that I, as, a, as an LCR pilot, could go flying with navigators. So it was quite interesting. We go and do UK tasking, and um, the uh, the authorised would authorise me as the aircraft captain for the day. You know, it's this aeroplane, six hours, go and support the army doing this, 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 and this. Fab. And the authorised would basically say, right, you know, you're you're the captain. But if he comes back, that navigator who's much more experienced than you is actually there to look after you and put a leash on you. If he comes back and tells me you've been an idiot, you're, you're for the high jump. So you were captain because um, you had to be because the navigator couldn't be captain. But you were under no illusion that you know you were you were there to learn. And, and I looked at my logbook a while ago, comparing it to what some of the guys are getting now. Now we're all pilot again, rather than there's very few, if any, navs left. And my first tour on 27, I did something like. Uh, five, six hundred hours, and almost half of them were as a navigator, with, with, with a navigator rather. So I had a lot of captain's time very quickly on the Chinook, which was the norm at the time. Yeah. Uh, and later on, as we went to all pilot, it wasn't unusual for guys to get combat ready and only actually have 15, 20 hours as captain, yeah. because they'd all only ever flown with, with combat ready captains or with training staff, pretending to be captain, but not actually being captain. So I, was, I considered myself very lucky that I got to a, a really good flight with some really good people at a really good time. And, you know, I, I flew and flew and flew and flew those first couple of years on 27. They were brilliant. So we actually haven't talked about that. What was it actually like to fly? Um, the Chinook was immensely powerful. Uh, it, it, it's a beast of an aeroplane. Um, if you consider on the wheels without fuel or crew, it weighs about 11 and a half tonnes. Max takeoff weight is about 23 tonnes and the max you could lift with an unslung load underneath was about 24 and a half tons. So it gives you about 13 tons of vertical thrust if you put it in those terms. Um, incredibly maneuverable for its size. Anybody that's seen the Chinook display will find it hard to argue that for its size, it does stuff you think you shouldn't do. Um, the combination of power and the controllability of the aircraft, it's not a heavy aeroplane to fly. It's actually relatively lightweight to fly. Um, yeah, an example of performance figures, uh, most light aircraft take off, you'll climb, you'll climb somewhere between 700 and 1,000 feet per minute. Something like a Spitfire or a Mustang on takeoff, climb a height, it will climb at about 1,700 or 2,000 feet per minute. In the Chinook, at light weights, you could sit there in the hover, pull 100%, 
and the thing will climb vertically at over 4,000 feet per minute. That's impressive. Uh, absolutely brutal amount of power. In fact, you were limited to how high you could climb because there was a concern that if you had an engine failure, actually you'd slow the blades down so much you'd never get it back. So you were actually limited to how high you could, how fast you could climb the aeroplane. But the power was there. So I used to, I used to um, make an analogy to something like a Westfield 7. You know, a brutal amount of excess power and then unfortunately aerodynamics take over and, you know the schnook you know it's it's a functional beauty you wouldn't describe it as a sleek svelte aeroplane in the mode of a spitfire um, it has the aerodynamics of a house brick with two rotor systems on top which is effectively all it is um, and eventually you just you know at 140 150 knots the thing stops accelerating quite so quickly but it will still happily accelerate beyond 160 which is what we redlined the aeroplane at especially if you were lightweight you still have more power to, to play with um, so very manoeuvrable, very powerful, very forgiving. Um, as, a, as a, you know, I, I, I talked to a lot of guys flying the Puma. The Puma at the time was, was quite unforgiving in terms of engine handling. The Chinook was completely carefree. You could pump those engines as much as you could without any real danger of drooping the, the, the NR, the rotor speed. It was a carefree aeroplane to fly. If you, if, when you were learning on it, lightweights, if you, if you mucked up a quick stop or you mucked up a wing over, at training weights in the UK, you always had loads of power. You just power yourself out of it if you made a mistake, mm -hmm. um, which is something that other helicopters didn't, you, didn't allow you to do. Now, that's great, but it's also one of the Chinook's downfalls is that you get so blasé about flying it. You've got you know, wind. What is wind? Now, most helicopters have to approach into wind. Chinook can land downwind 25, 30 knots, not a problem. Land crosswind, not a problem. I've landed downwind on an aircraft carrier, which is completely against all the regulations. The Navy couldn't say, yeah, you can't do that. You know, well, I'll, wait, I'll sit here and wait 10 minutes while you turn this boat round, so I'll just land downwind. Um, interesting, landing in your own seat salt spray, but it, the aeroplane can do things that you just, you can take liberties with it. You then take it to somewhere like uh, Iraq in the height of summer, you take it to Afghanistan, where it's high, it's hot, you've got high density altitudes. You have to then remember you cannot flow the aeroplane around like you do in the UK because you know it's mortal you know i've flown a chinook to nearly 20,000 feet to do an oxygen trial it's happy up there i wasn't happy up there it felt very slow to be up that height um but um the, the the you have to just have that healthy respect that the i used to categorize the chinook really as as three airplanes up to about 15 16 tons do what you like with it because the thing has just got brutal power and you could hover hover on one engine um in the uk with three tons of fuel and two and a half tons of payload on one engine um, on, a, on a normal day broadly um, it was a second aircraft between about 16 tons and 20 tons treat a bit more respect once you started going over 21 ton 20 21 tons it was time to start thinking yeah i need to fly this airplane think about wind think about power margin think about committed calls all the stuff that 90 percent of the time in the chinook you never have to think about okay um crew wise i think one thing to say right at the start the chinook was a crew airplane it was absolutely a crew aeroplane. Um, it wouldn't function without crewmen. It only functioned because of the crewmen. Um, the pilots, the navigators, we were there to deliver the crewmen to where they needed to be. Uh, the crewmen controlled the cabin, the crewmen controlled the underslung load, they controlled the troops. They helped us with the navigation when we were, when we were struggling in terms of nav and, and comms in the front of the aeroplane. They'd man the guns, they would do everything for us. So the crew, normally four people, pilot nav in the front two pilots and then two crewmen down the back one at the front right door one at the ramp um, if you were doing something that was very benign like instrument flying you really didn't want to put two crewmen through the torture of flying around the instrument pattern for two hours so you just take one crewman um, so normally a crew of four and and absolutely a crew of four um, there was no you know i every aircraft captain did differently i had a definite no rank policy the moment we, we we walked onto the onto the ramp of the aircraft it was nicknames or first names and the whole point there was everybody got a vote so the crewman could be the most junior sergeant in the squadron if he turned around and said foo i'm not happy with something he didn't go makes sense um it was it was yeah, those guys made the airplane work we just delivered them to where they needed to have their effect in terms of number of people in the back i think the most i carried was about 70 odd paras into into kosovo in the summer of 99 I think the Americans hold the record, or maybe we hold it now, with Iraqi POWs. But you can certainly get over 120 odd people into the back of the aeroplane. Um, if you just take all the seats out, and what you do is you put, you basically put um, string ropes down the inside of the cabin and it becomes like the inside of an underground train. Everybody shuffles on, holds on, and away you go. 
So getting onto the cockpit, could you describe it for us? <laughs> yeah. If it's possible. Yeah. Um, uh, the Mark II, the Mark III that I spent most of my time flying, I'm passing acquaintance with the Mark IV. Mark II and III um, was a classic 70s, 80s steam driven cockpit. It's uh, smaller than you might think it is. Um, the aircraft really is a box that they needed to fly. So the, the designer said, right, we need to move this much cargo volume from A to B. Right, so I want to box that big. Right, oh yeah, now we need to put some engines, undercarriage, fuel, rotor systems and a cockpit on. So the cockpit of the Chinook is almost like an afterthought. It's substantially smaller than you think it is. Um, it's, uh, it's visibility is pretty good. It detracts a bit when you start putting armour in, the, in the, some of the windows to protect yourself. Um, the seats are armoured, seats are actually, you know, I spent eight, eight, nine hours at a time strapped into that aeroplane sometimes. And I'm one of the lucky ones. I haven't got neck or back problems, and a lot of people have. Um, but the cockpit itself was, uh, it was intuitive. It was relatively high workload. Nothing was really joined up. It was all federated systems inside the cockpit, which is good in some terms, because it means you could just rip something out, put something in. Um, but also meant that you were doing a lot of times, you were looking around the cockpit, looking for what, bit of instrumentation you were going to, to, to tune or to move or to use or select. Unlike a modern system like the Mark IV with its lovely multifunction displays in front of you where it's a lot more information is in front of you. Um, I, have a, I, have a, I do believe that multifunction displays are a two-edged sword. With so much information it's very, very tempting to just look at them the whole time. So because there was nothing that interesting to look at inside the Chinook cockpit at the time, the old steam driven ones, you were heads out a lot more, I would suggest. So, I don't know if you could describe, but uh, a typical day on 27 squad? Um, lots of coffee. Um, I think that's the same with most flying squadrons. Um, so a typical day, you'd turn up whatever time Met Brief was, 8, 8.30. Um, the Fly Pro would have been out the night before. In fact, you know, we normally used to issue a weekly Fly Pro, so you knew which days you were flying, which days you weren't, and that sort of you know, effectively worked out what time whether you were going to come in, unless there was a specific reason. You'd be in earlier than that. And maybe if you were flying first wave, you'd come in brief, go to Met Brief and then walk. Um, so yeah, 8.30ish, Met Brief, um, then coffee. Uh, and then it would depend really whether you were flying or not. So if you're flying, say you're flying um, lunchtime, you'd probably, uh, you'd probably, if you hadn't planned the day before, you'd go and plan the sortie, depending on what you were going to do. If you were going to go to the tap park and fly on a sung loads for two hours for the benefit of the crewman, wasn't really much planning involved at all. Um, you just did a crew brief and you went and did it. it provided you'd liaise with the hookers to make sure they were there and the loads were there. If you were to go and do instrument flying, again, you're a, bit, a little bit more involved. You have to go and plan it, put the file of flight plan, book the places you want to go and do practice instrument approaches at. And if you're tasking, a tasking day with the army, a bit more work as well. You're going to make sure that all the, the, the maps were up to date. You had your low level flying bookings in. Uh, you checked the NOTAMs and you'd made sure you weren't going to embarrass yourself by flying through something that you shouldn't have done. So maybe a two hour pre you know, typically I would start, start a brief a couple of hours before we went to lift off to give us time to do a full comprehensive brief. So for a, I don't know, a two o'clock in the afternoon takeoff, maybe if it was not a complicated sortie, you know, coffee, planning room, maps for an hour or so, prepare a brief, get the Met, update, and then do a Met brief, do a, then do an out brief to the authoriser to make sure he was, he's the, if you like, the gatekeeper. He makes sure that you're not going off to do something you're not qualified to do and he ensures that the planning that you've done is adequate for the task you're going to go and do, and that the aircraft's serviceable. Sign for the aeroplane, walk out to it, strap it in, go fly. So, have you ever operated on large exercises? Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, we, we used to have a, a regular large exercise in the UK, uh, tactical leadership training, NITEX, every year, which was always a, a hoot and a roar. Um, most of which we can't divulge on public means because there was um, some interesting weekends in St Andrews involved. Uh, but um, yeah, you know, night composite air operations, night cameos, up to 60, 70 aircraft, fast jets, helicopters, um, transport aircraft, tankers, support aircraft, sometimes multinational. You'd have sometimes have the French and the Americans pitching in and playing. Um, great fun, fantastic learning experiences. They were great when we had a, an Air Force big enough to actually stage them. Um, uh, exercises in Canada, we supported the Army in Batus uh, in, in Exercise Medman. That was interesting, flying the aircraft around Canada. Got the opportunity to fly, do some mountain flying in the Rockies, which was fantastic fun. Um, but we never quite got the chance to go to Red Flag, which is a, a shame. But 
here. The th difference between flying a jet across the Red Flag is that they can self-deploy with a tanker. Getting a Chinook to somewhere like Red Flag is, is, a, is a major undertaking because you've got to have air transport there or you've got to ship it there and it's just it's expensive and you've got to have a real justification for doing it so we do take the aircraft around the world we used to go to norway to do snow training go to morocco to do sand training we ended up in the southwest united states for quite a long time prepping our guys to go to afghanistan by practicing dust landings in the desert over there but you know, big exercises outside sort of tlt nitex and some of the old nato chaos exercises which were great fun um i never got to do anything bigger than that so did you ever train with other nations' uh, Chinooks at all? Um, <coughs> trained, not directly. Um, obviously, if you went somewhere and there were American Chinooks in theatre, you'd meet up, you'd discuss stuff. Sometimes you would on the same mission, depending on what you're trying to do. But in, you know, there were the occasional exchange programmes. So you'd have the Dutch, for example. The Dutch were very proactive. Um, and on the tactics instructors course, we actually taught and qualified their first cadre of instructors in the UK. So they brought Chinook over and we flew with them. That was probably the closest I, I actually worked with. I actually sat in the cockpit and instructed in, in the Dutch Chinook as we were doing stuff. So there was um, the Dutch and the UK had a, have a very close relationship uh, when it comes to Chinook matters. And the, when I was, I was leaving the force, as the Canadians were coming online with their Chinooks, as I understand, there's a very good working relationship between the UK and Canada. Um, and a number of our Chinook pilots have actually left the Air Force and gone and flown for the Canadians. Mm. So Paul, did you ever fly in operations? Yeah, I mean, I hit the, I was very lucky, I hit the Chinook at, at quite a busy time for the Chinook force. I mean, it sounds mad when you talk about it now with what the guys have done over the last 10 years in Afghanistan. But um, we had a, a series of standing detachments when I got to the aircraft. So we had a stand detachment in Northern Ireland supporting um, counter-terrorism there. We had a standing detachment in the Falkland Islands supporting the garrison task down there. And we had a standing task in Bosnia doing peace enforcement. Um, so uh, we were, those of us that were in the Chinook Force sort of 95 to 2007, probably saw pretty much every scale of operations from peace enforcement, peace um, uh, implementation through counter-terrorism in Northern Ireland, counter-insurgency in, in Afghanistan and conventional war fighting, which was certainly at least the first few days of the Iraq war in 2003. So, uh, you know, I saw uh, a lot of Northern Ireland. Um, I went to Northern Ireland very early in my flying career and ended up, you know, you've been, you can go again and ended up as the Northern Ireland training captain for one of the squadrons I was on. So I was, every time the detachment role came out, oh, funny old thing, I'm in Northern Ireland again. I only got the merest time in, in Bosnia, uh, three or four weeks in Bosnia, which I'd like to have spent more time in. It was a very interesting country. Um, and then Kosovo was took, dominated the summer of 99 um, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and then Iraq in 2003 and a couple of, you know, one very short tour in Afghanistan in 2011 and a slightly longer one in 2012. The Chinooks essential in the, these operations? Um, <clears throat> I'm going to say yes. Um, it's only essential, and you've got to deconstruct what the army are trying to achieve. So you have an estimate. The army will go away and run an estimate and say, right, to do this job that we've mandated to do by the government to deliver this effect, we need to do this. And uh, is the Chinook absolutely necessary? Well, for some of those missions, yes, it was the only thing that could carry stuff. So moving heavy stuff, heavy single point items uh, into an, in an operational theatre, yes, it's essential for that. No, in some respects, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a, a company insertion, 120 odd guys, you know, that's comfortably, that's three Chinooks. In extremists, it's two. Um, something like a Puma, you're probably looking at gusting 10, 8 to 10 aircraft. So you can always throw numbers at it. And there's an argument that works both ways. You know, somebody could turn around and say, we'll be we sending three Chinooks. If we lose one, we lose 30% of our troops on the ground. That's not a good idea. If we send 12 Pumas and we lose one, we're losing 10%. So there, there was always that argument, both slides of the scale, and it was depending of, of, of what you actually wanted to do. Um, some of the stuff, so the um, you know, stuff we did in 2003 off Art Royal, the Chinook gave you much more capability per deck spot than a Merlin or a Sea King or a Puma. And the Puma at the time really didn't want to land on an aircraft carrier anyway. So essential, probably in, in some cases, yes, but I would suggest optimal in others. Did the Chinook get any special upgrades there for this? Uh, a number, obviously some I can't talk about. Um, what I would say is that uh, 
there's always a, a threat. The threat always changes and the threat is, you know, it's not just things like this hind. The threat is stuff on the ground. The threat can also be the weather. Uh, you can also be asked to go and fly the aeroplane somewhere where you've not flown the aeroplane before. And there could be something unique about the weather. You know, Afghanistan is a, an example where, you know, when it's dark, it's proper dark. And, you know, people will say, ah, MVGs, they turn day into night. Well, all that MVGs are are image intensifiers. And all they do is intensify whatever photons are bouncing off the ground. Afghanistan, for a couple of weeks every month, was so dark. And the surface, the minerals and whatever was in the surface meant that whatever starlight there was just didn't reflect off. It just absorbed it. So for two weeks of the, of the month, Afghanistan was just like, you know, MVGs were fr frankly useless. Um, so you would try and give the crew something else to help them in those circumstances so a flare turret something like that for example so you the chinook uh, a, a bold statement i'll make here um the air force has traditionally always been run by fast jet crews or fast jet crews and one of the things we came back from kosovo with in 99 was our lack of secure radios and we said you know we need secure radios we had a bit of a bit of a faff crossing the border uh you know we had 14 helicopters eight chinook six pumas plus two american uh, Apaches are 20 helicopters steaming towards the border at first light because they'll clearly never expect us to come at first light and uh, we got to within about two miles of the border and we could see the border ahead of us we could see all the you know the, the world's press lined up effectively because it was quite well trailed we were coming and um, somebody said oh, we got border crossing authority uh, 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 I don't know and we didn't have any secure radios so we, had to, so we then turned this whole wagon train round circled for about 20 minutes while we worked out whether we actually had border crossing authority which because we had to speak in veiled because we were on an open unsecured radio so we'd put a request in for for secure radios back in 1999 2006 you know, 2003 we're flying around uh, iraq without secure radios 2006 we're flying around afghanistan without secure radios because there's always something more important that the air force wanted to buy rather than put secure radios on a chinook and so a lot of the time you've said i need secure radios this is how much it's going to cost and the air force would rack and stack all their priorities and go no, 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 you know, we'd, we'd quite like to put a new paint scheme on a tornado and therefore we can't afford it. Uh, and eventually you end up doing a thing called, it used to be called urgent operational requirements, which, later, which are now called urgent capability requirements, is where you go to a theatre, you turn up and go, ta-da, here we are, oh, oh, we didn't know about that, or oh, we didn't know about that. And then the radio example, the Americans turn around and say, well, you can't fly unless you've got secure radios. Oh, well, oh, you mean can't fly? No, we're not letting you fly. Ah. Uh. Uh, yeah, that secure radio stuff you've turned down for the last eight years. We need it. Can you do it? And so you end up putting something on the aircraft. So when you say, do they receive capability upgrades? Yes, they do. Um, I did a lot of them when I was working at the integrated project team. A lot of them are whatever you can throw on the aeroplane quickly that solves a problem. The problem with that is they're quite often not what you would buy if you had the full choice. If you could wait two years and do it properly, you don't always meet all the requirements that the users have. And whatever you do is nearly always optimized towards that particular operation. The idea behind it is that at the end, because they're paid for by the treasury, they're not paid for by the defense budget. So the treasury, you have to go to the treasury and convince them that you've, you've, you know, you've taken us to war. The defense, the defense budget is effectively your insurance policy. The urgent operational requirements are effectively what you have to pay uh, as your um, you know, uh, excess. So you have to go and convince them that you really do need this. And if it's cut and dried, like they won't let us fly unless we've got this, then that becomes, well, that's politically unacceptable. That won't look very good in the House of Commons. So uh, here's the money, go and do it. But what you don't, but the mo at the moment the war ends, the moment the campaign ends, or the need for that equipment ends, the money stops. And you then either got to take it off your airplanes or somehow find the money inside your existing budget to support it. So the army going off, off peace at the moment, the army at the moment have, got a, have had a massive thought thinks bubble over the last couple of years because in Afghanistan, they've had tens of thousands of, of new vehicles bought for them. You know, a lot of them optimized for Afghanistan. So they haven't got roofs. So you want to, you know, suddenly you've got a whole load of vehicles that are designed to fly some, you know, drive around somewhere where it doesn't rain that much. And you want to go on Salisbury Plain and wonder why everybody gets miserable because well, you've bought something that's optimized for the desert. So that's the, the, the danger of the UOR, UCR, is that you buy stuff that's very short termist. It's good because the guys get something they don't get necessarily what they would want if you had the time or what they need if you had the time and the money to do it properly. So do you have any stories you can actually share with, uh, with those from the time of operations? Um, uh, yes, um, I have to take the fifth on several of them um, because of uh, sensitivities among certain people. Um, some funny ones, yeah, we had, a, um, we had a grounding in Kosovo in 99 and the, uh, 
the American Chinooks were grounded, we were grounded because um, of uh, cracks were found in some gearboxes. And so we invited the Americans over to our compound, we'd, we'd, we'd sneaked off, got some beers, invited the Americans over to our compound and they'd been gated by their own people. They said, nope, you're not leaving the compound, it's far too dangerous. So um, <clears throat> we, ended up com we ended up doing the Great Escape in Reverse, which is where we broke into the American compound with beer and had a few beers with the American Chinook pilots. That was quite amusing because they had, literally had watchtowers and everything. And luckily we'd, we'd had a couple of beers ourselves with this stage, so we thought it was quite funny. And afterwards, the next morning, they said that wasn't really funny at all, we shouldn't be doing that. So that was quite funny. Um, we had a, uh, a very good night stop in, um, at what used to be RF Finningley, uh, now Doncaster International Airport. And it was my last trip um, before I went to a ground job and I was expecting not to fly again. And um, I'd asked a night stop at Doncaster and the squadron higher up, no, no, far too expensive, go to Linton on Ooze. Mm, fair enough. <clears throat> and we're flying, flying through the overhead of Doncaster towards Linton on Ooze. And um, we're sort of all sitting there going, oh, wouldn't it be great to have a night stop in, in Doncaster? I can't believe the squadron, let's do it. And then literally, as we said that, bing, on came, one of the en on came an engine caption. And normally you'd, you, you would say, you know, captain of crew, engine, you know, engine chip debtor, whatever the caption was. And all I said was, how the hell did you do that? Because I had a few, one of the crewmen down the back had jammed a screwdriver in somewhere and put this caption up. And it wasn't, it's one of those absolutely priceless moments where just at the right time, the aircraft decided, you know, obviously you thought, well, I'll give you something that's just bad enough for you to have to divert, but not bad enough for you to have any long-term problems fixing me. And so we ended up diverting into, uh, into Doncaster and if, uh, and if Carlsberg did night stops, that was it. Brilliant. So you then went on to the Royal ET. Can you tell us about this? Yeah, it was a, um, it's an organisation that's gone through various names over, over the years and it has two main aims. Um, first aim is um, operational test and evaluation of any new equipment that comes into the aircraft and supporting the project team and supporting the um, industry in suggesting what would be a good bit of equipment to go on the aircraft. And the second half of the job was teaching the tactics instructors course and providing subject matter expertise into the training cycle for the squadrons and for um, the Air Warfare Centre. Tell us a little bit about the IPT. Yeah, the integrated project team. Um, every Every um, major platform in the UK military has a project team that looks after it. Um, at the time, back in uh, 2006, it was an integrated project team. And what that basically did was it looked at the in-service support for the aeroplane. So what you needed in terms of spares, what you needed in terms of providing oils, engineers, all that sort of stuff into the aircraft. And it also looked at what you were going to need in the future, maybe two years time, five years time, 10 years time, looking at it in terms of both obsolescence because a bit like if you think about a laptop, you buy a laptop now, in three years time, it hasn't got a hope of playing the latest game because technology moves on. And it's the same with aeroplanes, the same with, with helicopters, where you have something that's in production, you know, uh, you know, certainly something that's got avionics inside it, it's got chips inside it, you find suddenly that, that chipset is no longer produced. So you have a, you know there's a certain amount of time in the future where you're gonna to have to change that component because you won't be able to get spares for it anymore. So you do quite a lot of that as well. You look ahead and go, right, in five years time, we won't be able to buy that radio anymore. What do we do? And you've got a number of choices. You can ask, say, well, I'm gonna buy 500 radios now, put them in store, and that will last me for the next 25 years. Or you say, okay, let's buy maybe 50 radios and start a program to replace it. And that's what the project team was all about at the time. So we had a lot of programs, those urgent operational requirements to, to upgrade the aeroplane for Afghanistan. Um, most of them I can't talk about, unfortunately. Um, but we also had concurrent programs going. I mean, the biggest two really were a, um, a cockpit upgrade program, Julius, which took the aircraft from the Mark II to the Mark IV, where we put a partial glass cockpit into it, amongst other things. And then the, the very heavily trails mark three reversion program and yeah, you know, i imagine a lot of the viewers will be familiar with the airplanes that arrived we couldn't fly them in cloud or we couldn't fly them at night it's all far too dangerous went stuck them in a hangar at boscombe down while we had a big argument with boeing over over whose fault it was um, <clears throat> the aircraft were you know, fundamentally fine the argument was over over the availability of of code that sat within the, the flight the flight um, instrument system so we could assure ourselves the code was safe the fact that the identical lines of code were flying overhead every day in 737s was neither here nor there. So we had a very, very, uh, I think after, as a knock-on effect from some of the issues around the Mullock entire accident that happened in 95, we had a very, very um, safety first attitude on the Mark III's. But we then had a bit of a three or four years of rowing over with Boeing about what we we're gonna do. Eventually came to a conclusion and uh, 
we set off to, to modify these aeroplanes into with a glass cockpit. Ironically, the same glass cockpit we then ended up putting into the Mark IIs. Um, the problem we had was uh, a sensitive issue about airworthiness of various various sub marks of the aeroplane. And in 2006, there, you may remember there's a lot of red top headlines about the army, the paras, saying we haven't got enough helicopters in um, Afghanistan. What are we going to do? Um, we need more helicopters. They haven't provided us. But the air force is, quote unquote, utterly, utterly useless. Was, was the quote of the day. So the government panicked to a degree. Said, just buy. Where can we get more helicopters from? Um, so I, uh, you know, I was the requirements manager for the Chinook. Um, can you go and tell us where you can go and buy Chinooks tomorrow? Ah. Uh, so anyway, wikied it as you do. Great God, wiki. Uh, wikied it and. Um, I came back and I phoned and made a few phone calls and said, right, okay, um, all the American production slots are booked for the next few years. They're not going to help us. Um, I've asked about secondhand American Chinooks. They're kind of interested, but they're a little bit reluctant because we buy secondhand Chinooks, we might not buy any new ones. Um, I said, uh, all the UAE ones have gone out of the desert. Uh, sorry, the, the Libyan ones, because the, um, the UAE have bought those already. I said, I have found 70 Chinooks though. And they go, brilliant, brilliant, where is that? I said Iran. Well, that's that's a non-starter, isn't it? So, basically, the government had this big pressure. I need to I need to be seen to be doing something. So, the only aircraft we could actually physically lay our hands on, in a short enough time scale that we thought would make a material difference to the war in Afghanistan, and provide the the headline that the government of the day wanted, were the Mark Threes. And so we stopped the mid program. Stop! Stop! And we turned them around and, and we put a, a steam copy back into them. The ironic, ironic thing behind, behind that is that when they were built, they were built with the steam cockpit. They were flown out of Ridley Park, the Boeing factory down to Shreveport, Louisiana, where the, the, um, the partial glass was put in. And they were shipped to the UK. Everybody went, oh, I can't fly it. Uh, and then we ended up putting that steam cockpit back into it. And at the moment, they have just finished in the Mark V program where the glass cockpit they were going to get in about 2007 is now going into them now in 2015 to 17. So this, it's like, like this, it's like cockpit swap all the time with the Mark III's. So they, those, were the, those were the two big programs we had running at the Chinook project team at the time. So can you tell us briefly what happened after this one? Yeah, I went back to Ruitu as the flight commander uh, for Chinook and Search and Rescue, which was interesting. Um, so we get a lot of the, I ended up marking a lot of my own homework. So a lot of things that I'd bought in the project team, I ended up uh, running the trials program for, which is a little bit incestuous. Um, but I also got to fly the um, another version of this, the Bell, the Bell 412, the Griffin at um, Valley, as um, I had to do at least show some understanding of how search and rescue worked. So I did a SAR short course on this, which was great fun. Uh, and then I did a short course on the Sea King as well. So I got to fly the Sea King 3 and the Sea King 3A um, a little bit as well. Um, very like the Wessex. It took you right back. Um, a lot of the, the cockpit was very similar. A lot of the terminology was very similar. Some of the instruments were very similar. So flying the Sea King was, um, was a real trip down memory lane. It's very nostalgic. Um, and I think, you know, I think Faz brought it out very well in his interview where he talked about the smell of, of aeroplanes of that vintage. And the, you know, the Wessex definitely had that smell and the Sea King had that smell as well. Um, that smell of sort of leather and oil and hydraulics and all that sort of stuff. Um, and it was, a, it, was, it was a, you know, I had quite a lot of fun flying the, uh, the Sea King and doing Going back to doing sort of winching and decks and stuff like that was, after years and years and years of flying the Chinook, was actually really interesting. So, how long did your RAF career last and did you enjoy it? <clears throat> uh, I absolutely loved it. I left after 23 years. Um, it was fantastic. I, I was, a, I was a very much of the opinion that you left while you still loved it, you left while you enjoyed it. I saw a couple of people over my time that probably stayed a couple of years too long clinging on for that promotion they thought was going to happen but never did or the the posting to the the dream posting that was that was always promised and never did never happened um you know i left having done a really good had a really good career i left having done a really interesting job looking at future technology so my last job now be to look at uh, fast jets at weapons at uavs and lots of other stuff that i really hadn't had much opportunity to look at because i've been head down looking at helicopters for nearly 20 years so it was um the right time to step outside for, for, for both the Air Force and for me. So Paul, do you have any hobbies? Um, yeah, I'm a complete um, history geek, as most people that know me uh, will attest to. So yeah, I have a, 
I like a bit of sport. I like cricket. I like rugby. But I, I really do like history, uh, and I am a absolutely confirmed history geek. Do you have a favourite tipple? Yeah, uh, bourbon on the rocks or a nice glass of Merlot, preferably with a Monte Cristo number no. two or a Cohiba Robusto. So not a pint of fossils. Uh, no. Do you have a favourite aircraft you've flown? Favourite aircraft I've flown. Um, I'm going to cheat and split it into aircraft and helicopter. Um, so favourite helicopter has to be the Chinook. Although um, I've flown the Black Hawk a few times and it comes a very close second. Uh, aircraft, I'm going to go for the Pilatus P2, which is slightly off the wall, um, but an absolutely just, just a heavenly aeroplane to fly, you know, a big inverted engine up the front, just delightful handling qualities. And that was probably the nice, sweetest aeroplane I've ever flown. Is the one you wish you could have flown? Uh, yes, P51 Mustang every day and twice on Sundays. So what are you currently up to? So I currently run my own company, uh, providing a degree of consultancy into MOD when required, into industry if asked for, and I sit on three NATO working groups helping with future helicopter technology. So still very much involved, still talk to the guys on the front line, still want to have that understanding of their needs so that we can help shape what's coming down the line in 5, 10, 15 years time to be something they can actually use. Because there is nothing worse than giving guys a bit of kit and then seeing them turn around and say, well, that's not what I wanted. Mm. So the idea is hopefully um, start the process early enough so that when, when the kit arrives, it's actually what they want and what they need. Yeah. And finally, do you ever get sick of talking about aviation? No. Again, everybody who knows me will be absolutely 100% behind that. I can bore for NATO and probably have for most of the last half an hour. <laughs>